morning. My name is Pevany Manuel. I, am going to, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Gavin Britz. Dr. Gavin Britz serves as the director of the Houston Methodist Neurological Institute, the chairman uh, of the Department of Neurosurgery and the Candy and Thompson Hood uh, Centennial a chair of neurosurgery at the Houston Methodist Hospital. He's also a professor of neuro neurological surgery at uh, Will Connell Medical College. Dr. Britz leads a, an acclaimed team of neurosurgeons and affiliated pr professionals and is recognized as one of the nation's foremost experts in cerebrovascular, skull-based, and brain tumors. Uh, he is uh, included in the Masters of Neurosurgery book. He has received the best doctor in America uh, distinction six different years. He also serves on the advisory board of the Joe Nicker uh, Foundation and the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, and serves on the editorial board of Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, and International Journal of Vascular Medicine, uh, as well as Surgical Neurology International um, and data set uh, papers. He has authored more than uh, 110 peer-reviewed scientific manuscripts, 30 chapters, and two. That's an old Bible. That's true. Well, he's one of our experts, and we're glad to have him. Well, uh, help me welcome Dr. Britz. Thanks. Sorry, I'm, a little, I'm a little late. I'm running around. Anyways, thanks for the invite. So what I'm going to really talk about is what I've been doing uh, essentially my whole life in the, in the basic science lab. And what it is is looking at why people aren't the same after an aneurysm subarachnoid hemorrhage. When you look at the data, you know, we all think, oh, you have your aneurysm, you treated it, and I know when I was a resident, much, much before Kurt did, but, you know, people moved both arms after clipping, they were great, it was a great result, you know, then the coiling came around, then we thought, well, it'll get better, because it's all to do with clipping and, and strokes. But when you look at the data, even in the modern era, 95% of people that have an aneurysm subarachnoid hemorrhage are not the same again. And I think, as we all know, a lot of these population are less than 55, where you're going to make your most money and you're most productive for society. And I think one of the most important aspects of this slide, when you look at the hazard ratio of you developing dementia after subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, versus ICH and ischemic stroke, the hazard ratio is 2.74. Okay, so you have a much, much higher uh, risk of dementia after subarachnoid hemorrhage, even after an ischemic stroke. And we understand that obviously there's some change in the brain that occur. I'm going to, you know, not get into too much basic science, but some, but some, some basic science as well. Obviously, we don't understand why, and I think that's obviously a big problem. And hopefully, with a, we will start a clinical trial in regard to this uh, pretty soon. So when you look at it, when you go back in history, most of us at my age, and Jay Volpe's age, etc., we, you know, we thought that well, people that weren't the same again. It must be because of large vessel, uh, vases, large vessel vasospasm. spasm. But again, you look at the data, they, uh, only one in five at that time, and now it's decreased to one in 15, had developed large vessel vasospasm. spasm. So the focus at that time was in regard to the microcirculation, and it, including myself. And there was a paper by Yoshadi who came out, a Japanese researcher that showed these small vessel strokes on MRI scan of post subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we said, okay, we're going to focus on that. That's probably going to be the reason. And we looked at the vessels. We did this classical rat, uh, rat prep. We drew the cranial window, open up the window, measure, measure the vessels, caliber, and then give a whole lot of vasoactive agents. So we went into details, and we look at the results, shows as completely abnormal. So between three days and five days, these cortical uh, vessels were completely abnormal. So we thought, well, we're onto something. So that must be something, okay? So we said, okay, well, you know, that's good, but how about looking at the vessels that go from the surface of the brain into the brain? Uh, we put them on a pipette and do the same thing, you know, giving a whole lot of vasoactive uh, peptides, et cetera, and you can see yourself in the graphs compared to the sham, regardless of the agent we gave, be it ADP, prusside, et cetera, they just didn't respond as well. And obviously we go, we you know, went through the molecular mechanisms with the lower slide, but clearly at that time we had shown that the microcirculation, both the pill and the penetrating, was abnormal. So obviously you still say to yourself, well, that's great. You know, why is that important for, for the young people? You know, we know that the vascular resistance and the CBF is controlled at the microcirculation level, and we clearly had shown that it's abnormal. 
So when I was at Duke, you know, I'm just giving you some parts of the research years, we said I was, there was an epilepsy surgeon there that had a, a nice prep, uh, and we said, well, let's look at the in vivo slices and, and, and in vitro to see what the end organ, which is the hippocampus, what we want to study, what is the oxygen tension and how does it change in regard to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you look at the slide on the left, and I don't know this is a, okay, sorry, let me go back. Okay, where's the pointer over there? When you look at that slide on the left, a normal oxygen tension is about 26 in the hippocampus, okay? When you stimulate, or if we go inside, we take the, we expose the hippocampus, we stimulate, and the natural response, you find a little bit of a dip, because the oxygen utilization, and then you find a response where you increase demand, the blood vessels will respond, and you find that typical response. But when we looked at the hippocampus post subarachnoid hemorrhage, number one, the oxygen tension was toxic at that level, even in the hippocampus before we stimulated, and what we found was a completely paradoxical graph in regard to those, there was very high oxygen, oxygen tension in the tissues, too, too, too high, which is probably toxic. But when we stimulated, the classical response was a dip. And obviously clearly showed that now we've shown the peel, the penetrating, as well as the vessels deep in the hippocampus are clearly abnormal. We did that in vivo slices as well. So that's where we were. And so obviously at that time we said, well, how are we going to take it further? We know that uh, they we use certain drugs in the ICU, such as the cardipine and the modipine. We don't know how it really works, but I think partly it, re it relates to that. So when we came back, obviously we said we onto something in regard to the microcirculation. I'm not sure we could take it further, but let's look and get a robust um, mouse model and rat model for, for, for outcomes. And we did the same thing. And we, as you can, we publish it here, which clearly shows we now have a model to look at the more of the molecular mechanisms of why people, why rats, mice, and human beings are just not the same. If you look at that into details, spatial learning, optic recognition, everything clearly is abnormal in regard to this. So when you look at the classical subarachnoid hemorrhage, the blood lies on the surface of the brain. So if you take the hypothesis and say, well, how will the blood on the surface of the brain result in damage to the hippocampus, which is pretty well protected and deep within the brain. So our hypothesis, obviously it's multifactorial, the microcirculation, the strokes, the surgery play some role. But when you look at the hippocampus itself anatomically, we found no atrophy, we found atrophy, but we never found cellular loss. So I'm Locke McDonald's, another guy that did this research before I did, I'm probably the only one in the country that's even bothering now. So we said, well, how does that happen? So we, our big hypothesis for the lab is, that the blood lines in this, on the temporal fossa and you get um, damage into the rhinal cortex by damaging the perforant pathways as they come inside. So it's like a secondary injury. So that's what we had to go and prove and what we are trying to prove now. So obviously when you say to yourself, you have volume loss in the hippocampus, we know there's gonna be a little bit of CSF, there's gonna be you know, astrocytes, there's gonna be um, uh, neurons, and also obviously there's gonna be myelin. So the thing about there's no cellular loss, the only thing which you could expect is going to be myelin loss. So we said, well, let's do a transcriptome and see what we found. And we looked at the up-regulated up genes and down-regulated genes. I'm not a complete fan of this technique because it's a bit of a fishing expedition. But when you really looked at the genes that are overexpressed at four days post-subarachnoid, it's exactly what we, we hypothesized. There's suppression of oligodendrocytes and myelin rated genes, obviously genes that cause myelin formation. There's overexpression of inflammatory genes, particularly the complement system, we'll get that a little later, and the, and the genes that, that control interferon, TGF, BMP, were overexpressed. So this makes sense in regard to what's going on when you lose volume in the hippocampus, there's no myelin. It's not that their cells are dying or there's ischemic strokes to the hippocampus, even the hippocampus, as you know from the vascular neurologist, Coil, 1979, published paper that showed it's a really pause, you know, you know, paucity of vascular supply, but that didn't make sense in regard to this regard. So this is more of an inflammatory response. So we said, okay, well, that's what it is. And when you look at the hippocampus itself, particularly the, C, the different, different regions, we found that CA3 was loaded, and also we found there's dendritic pruning, and that makes sense. You look at the top slide on the left-hand side, you find the dendrites, and when you look at the ones below, we find a direct pruning. So again, this makes sense. You know, what's going on is an inflammatory mechanism that's related to complement, related to inflammation, that results in loss of myelin, but also an direct pruning to make people 
not as smart as they were. And we basically show that as well with hippocampal atrophy, not related to cellular loss, what people believe, but rather related to uh, myelin loss. So this, obviously, this is a quick 10, 15 minute talk, but this really supports it. Subarachnoid hemorrhage doesn't cause you know, microcirculation strokes in the hippocampus, but it really does result in degeneration of the afferent pathways in the hippocampus from the blood. And that results in the glossodontic spines, behavioral deficits, et cetera, and atrophy. So we had some in, uh, had some in there. So, hold on. This not working anymore. Network issue? Okay. He said to just press it once. What's that? I'll leave it up to the neurologist to figure that one out. If you just with the neurologist, he's going to find a workaround. Doesn't work, LJ. <laughs> okay. So that's the one thing. So obviously, I'm locking in. It's a 10 minute talk, but that just show you where we're going towards. And I always tell people inflammation is really good, but inflammation is really bad. And I was talking to some of the residents yesterday, I'm sure you guys saw the cancer risk in human beings has gone up, cancer's going out of, the, out of the wazoo, and part of that's inflammation. We cannot live with, without inflammation because we die with every infection, but again, an over-regulated excessive inflammation is, is bad, both in regard to cancer risk, but also in regard to inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and in our situation, uh, also in regard to why people aren't the same after subarachnoid hemorrhage. One of the newer things we've, we're looking at now and I'm a little angry at Olivia because we're trying to get MRI studies. When you look at subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, you know, we know you get hydrocephalus, okay? And so we said, well, let's try and work at the mechanisms of why people get hydrocephalus post subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, we take these rats, inject blood into the cisterna magna, that's a gene in Angelique, and we looked at four hours, four days, and 30 days, and 30 days. And what we found was this complete arrest of spinal fluid flow, okay? Now people will say, well, that's gonna be mechanical. No, we're not talking about a mechanical load that we put into the cystina magna. We are putting like a microscopic amount of blood, okay? So it shows you, this is not a mechanical hydrocephalus. This is to do with some molecular mechanisms. By chance, and that's Eugene, his idea, we said, well, let's try tissue factor, because we know tissue factor lies in the clear limitants. We said, how about trying to go inside and block tissue factor? And what we found, as we published in JCVF, that we can control the amount of CSF flow in the brain by molecular mechanism, particularly blocking tissue factors. We took these mice, we put it into particular puncture, gave tissue factor pre and post subarachnoids, and even in normal mice, we could change the flow. So I always say, we always talk about CSF flow, and Olivia, this is for you. You know, we say control of CSF flow is obviously the heart, the respiration, you know, the, the leader God's work on the microcirculation and, and the genome fatty flow. But also I think that God is a little smarter than us. And I think there's definitely a molecular component to the fine control of CSF flow. And that's what we're busy working on, we're working on now. So we say, well, how will that happen? So what caused the rest of the flow? Not going into detail. Obviously there's, there's not a mechanical, it's a smaller amount of blood. But we do know that fibrin, when we look for certain fibrin, fibrin was lining the glial limitants. And what is the glial limitants? All the glial limitants is that little lining of brain on, on the surface of the brain between the subarachnoid space, and we, th we think that plays a major role. And so we hypothesize that controlling the amount of expression of fibrinogen from the glial limitants controls the viscosity of the CSF, and that's what we're trying to work on in the future. So we said, well, if there's fibrinogen, you know, most people think fibrinogen is only in the blood. So we said, let's stain for fibrinogen. And what we found is we found fibrinogen lying extra, intracellular, but also on the, on the glia limitants. And without going into details for the 10 minute talk, we clearly found that you could express fibrinogen in the cells. That's just the publication we did. So that basically says the same thing. So we have changing fibrinogen is no longer just an extravascular or intravascular substance that gets expressed in the liver, it's also expressed intracellular, which can control the viscosity of CSF flow as it goes around. That's what we're doing in the study. So this, in conclusion for this talk, I think that, um, you know, 20 years ago, we thought it was always to do with surgeons, opening the head, you know, air hits your head, that's what's the problem. But I think it's really multifactorial why people have deficits post subarachnoid hemorrhage. You speak to the lawyers and say, you know what, I'm a high functioning guy, I had a grade one subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they still don't do well. And we think it's obviously the acute hydrocephalus, the real hydrocephalus, mechanical blockage. It's a stroke from the treatment, particularly when it's a Lando and Kurt, not me, um, but otherwise. And then also we've got to think about complement. 
how are we going to change that inflammation and CSF flow. We will be starting a trial, hopefully, and I'll talk to you guys about, is how are we going to look at RNA sequencing in regard to clinical changes in people with the subarachnoid population. It'll be a multinational, multi-site uh, site trial. But that's just like a 10 minute overview of the importance of subarachnoid hemorrhage and cognitive de uh, deficits.